Thank you, viewers, for joining us. I'm Karaga Bodrins, and we are live coming to you from the Campus International Conference Center. Today, I'm conducting on the spot. I'm standing in for my colleague, Kamara. And on the backdrop of uh, the yesterday peace deal that was done, the need to pacify South Sudan, of course, uh, signed from Khartoum, is what we're going to talk about. So yesterday, the, Sudanese, the South Sudanese President Salva Kiir, and of course, the, 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 South, the, the Sudanese People's Liberation Movement in opposition, S, a, a, SPLMOIO leader, Riek Mashal, who was the former vice president, of course, to uh, Salva Kiir, went into a peace agreement in Khartoum. And according to the Sudanese foreign minister who read the text of the deal, the parties agreed that the permanent ceasefire will come into effect on Saturday 30th June. Also, the parties agreed to open the humanitarian cor corridors, release detainees, withdraw troops, and militarily disengage. So our discussion on the spot is going to debate the viability of this round of peace initiative, its ramifications, and of course, the geopolitical implications of the entire region, and if it so succeeds, how will it sustainably stand the test of time? I'm Karagao Bodwins, and we are starting on the spot. So I have a resplendent panel with me here, and uh, right at my extreme end on this particular table, I have Dr. Tolit Atia, a security expert. Uh, Dr. Tolit, you're welcome. Thank you. Then next to him, I have Mwambusia Ndebesa, a political historian, Makere University. Good evening, viewers and listeners. Yeah, and next to him, I have David Amo, a South Sudanese, uh, South Sudan embassy official. You're welcome, David. And uh, a renowned journalist, uh, Angelo Izama, right next to me. So, mm -hmm. gentlemen, let me just give a backdrop to this whole agreement. The agreement calls on the African Union and IGAD to deploy protection forces and ceasefire monitors to observe the ceasefire implementation. The transitional government also is invited to take the needed measures to form national army and security forces away from tribalism and collecting weapons from civilians. They Initial draft proposed to have three capitals during the transitional period and to begin oil production by Sudanese workers and under the protection of Sudanese troops. So what is your take uh, on this landmark gesture? Is this the cessation of the overly long protracted war? Uh, do you feel this is going to be a possible success or is a future uh, struggle to have the pacification of South Sudan? Let me start with you, Dr. Tweed. Uh, <coughs> thank you. My very quick thought to this is that uh, peace building is not an event and it can't be an event. The agreement signed, the deal agreed on as we see it, is of course a welcome idea. It's a huge relief uh, for the situation in southern Sudan. Why? Uh, just to put it in perspective, this even could have changed by now. But you have about 2 million people displaced mm. within southern Sudan. You have 1 million. Mm. Those are the live pictures of actually the Sent event out yeah. who have already sought refuge out of southern Sudan. Um, you have about another 200,000 people, you know, roaming almost village to village. And then if you look at the figures of those key that atrocities committed, it's a dire situation. So this deal is a certainly welcome deal for the southern Sudanese and a huge relief for even the neighboring countries in the region. Whether this works or not, as you put it, I still insist peace building is not an event. Mm. All right. So let me get uh, your opinion, um, Wambusa. Uh, thank you. Um, I wish I could be proved wrong. But I don't see much in this peace deal <laughs> because the, it, is, it was not necessary. There is a constitution in Sudan. Let the protagonists follow the constitution and there will be peace in Sudan. Uh, some peace in Sudan. The, there are very many challenges in Sudan. Of course, it is a, 
a very huge country and therefore physical distance, social distance in terms of uh, the, uh, the literacy rates. Uh, of course, uh, very many ethnic groups also there. You can imagine that country which is uh, slightly bigger than Kenya, but only 12 million people, meaning they are very uh, much scattered. The state is still weak, but to me, if they had followed the constitution in the first instance, mm -hmm. this is Sarvakir who has been in power now, I think, 13 years. Initially a de facto head of state because he, he was at least the president of South Sudan, autonomous, uh, autonomous South Sudan. Then since 2011, he has been there. And around 2013, he started playing games with the constitution. He started uh, suspending governors whom he thought were not going to support him because there were supposed to be elections in 2015. And then finally, he suspended the, uh, the, 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 the cabinet. So the problem in Sudan actually is not as simple as something between Sarvakir and uh, Rakhmachar. No, because there is even opposition within SPRO, SPROM. Yeah, there, it yeah. is in, there is even because Rick Masha is also a splinter group from the original SPLM. Yeah, but it's he, SPLM is opposition. Sarvakir even yeah. has got opposition from his uh, Dinka people. We normally sure. say it is a Dinka and very issue. So the issue is this third term thing. These uh, uh, leaders who do not want to go away. And uh, it is being, this piece is being mediated and blocked by uh, 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 President Bashir. Mm. President Bashir, who doesn't want to leave power, he's playing around games. President Museveni, pres and now who in East Africa? President Sorry, Kagame, yeah. President Nkurunziza, <laughs> President Kabira, President uh, uh, Uhuru. You know, Uhuru also is a third term, but organization expressed as a tribe, the, mm. the Jikuyu. So East Africa has a problem. The Horn of Africa has a problem. Fundamentally, if we followed the constitution and if leaders in office wanted to leave power or to hand over power or were for handing over power, there would not be need for a peace deal. Just follow the constitution. Of course, there will be other problems, but failure to follow the constitution mm -hmm. will not make it any better that you will follow the peace deal. When there is a constitution, you are not following. It is okay. a question of the rule of law. So you're an essay on this particular aspect. The thing will not work. So David. I, I could be proved wrong. Yeah, no but problem. I, I, and I so wish I could. Let's but get I the South Sudan official, uh, embassy officer. So David, uh, there is a dispute that actually this is a futile attempt and uh, you're wasting your time. Actually, you, uh, the re government you're representing is part of the problem. Uh, what is your response to this particular uh, well, assertion? Uh, he's a historian, and uh, issues to do with the peace. Sometimes they are unfolded events until they reach to a certain one. It is has to be written off as a history. He talks about the constitution. The constitution, if you remember the the genesis of the of the conflict itself started within the SPLM. And for me, I'm a member of the National Liberation Council. Mm -hmm. When we call on the conference for the National Liberation Council members... So the National Liberation Council is part of the SPLM? It is the, 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 the parliament. It is the Senate. <coughs> Good. It is the Senate of the SPLM. Okay, thanks for clarifying. So we had ahead of us uh, to prepare for uh, the elections then was due to 2015. So the SPLM, we went and said, including those of Riyang Machar and the rest who turned up to be rebels, went and said, by then we were members. And when we sat down, some of them said, no, you are not a flag bearer. And some of them said, no, the constitution of the party itself had got to do with some amendment. And this amendment need the Senate to deliberate on. And some of them said, no, we should not go to amend the constitution of the party. What we need is power now. Now, if someone wanted the power now, do you have time really to read the constitution to them? And that was why in the eve of the same evening, they took up arms and they staged the coup. 
-hmm. and the fighting style. Who are you talking about that took uh, stage the coup? The, the group, group of uh, those of Riyad Machar. All right. Yeah. Okay, so do you think this attempt to... This is, the an, yeah, this is an the attempt day. that will bring us think? back to mm -hmm. the constitution uh, that the professor is talking about. Okay, great. Yeah. So you are so optimistic it, it, yeah, that Yeah, I, I am. I am, absolutely. Okay, 100%. I have one, one particular yes yeah. voter on this particular mm -hmm. motion. Yes, uh, Izama, what is your view about this? There is a conflicting uh, kind of reading of this particular attempt that it's pretty futile, of course, from the <laughs> two contributors, and he says mm -hmm. that it's going to work out, and yeah, your take. You've been very engrossed in this particular subject, so I need to get Yeah, it. but mostly my view of South Sudan is from across the border. Because, <coughs> mm -hmm. you know, my interests are tied mostly to um, <coughs> what Uganda does and what Uganda wants. And, you know, from, uh, from this side of the border, of course you want any kind of peace to work. Uh, we're hosting a very large number of South Sudanese refugees. Uh, my town... Uh, actually, the di two of the districts where I hail from, Moyo and Ajumani, I think, both have got more refugees than locals in those districts. Um, there is a major environmental degradation, you know, because we are hosting a large number of people that need the land and trees. And before you get to the humanitarian crisis which they face, they ought not to be in uh, uh, on this side of the border. They ought to be safely in their homes. Uh, so the desire is that any kind of peace mm. ought to work. And like David says, you know, if, you suck, if this kind of uh, uh, deal making brings the, uh, stops the guns, even if it's for three months, yeah. I think this will be a huge relief. Mm. Uh, I think no one has any illusions that we're going to play this by, by the day, basically. You know, if the ceasefire starts, will it hold the first day? Will it hold the second day? Will it hold for a week? Mm. Will it hold for longer? Uh, if you've been in situ situations of conflict, actually, you know, these small pockets of, uh, uh, of peace, they can change the climate under which people talk. Mm -hmm. And to that extent, you know, I, I, I am hoping that uh, uh, people would, uh, would see the sense in uh, sitting down together. In terms of the geopolitical context within which this is happening, I am a little bit more skeptical you know, <laughs> the truth of the matter is that peace in South Sudan uh, is unusual. Uh, he sits in the National Liberation Council, you know, peace has been there. In fact, the end of war has been there for a very short time mm -hmm. in the long history of, of the South. You know, I, I, I was reading John Garang's speech at the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in 2005. Um, and he was talking about the genesis of the problem of South Sudan, but he did make reference to the many years of war. Uh, out of the, you know, Uganda was, Garang went to war in <coughs> three months or so after Uganda got independence. Mm. Went to the first battles. South Sudan got independence, the, the Sudan got independence, while South, the South was at war. So the default, I think, for Sudan is conflict, and it's a very broken nation, and, and it's, it's going to take a while uh, to mend it. Mm -hmm. And this current geopolitical context within which uh, things are happening uh, may not still uh, mean the perfect conditions for, for peace if there's such a thing have arrived. Yeah, so your interpretation is 50-50 about the viability. <laughs> if, you're, if you're scoring, I'm, <laughs> just being, I'm just being realistic. I think yeah. that, you know, yeah. refugees who are from the south yeah. would love to return home. You know, I was a refugee in South Sudan, actually in Nimule. Mm. In the, in the 80s, in the you know at the beginning of the 80s, when Uganda was in conflict, and a lot of Ugandans only returned in 1986, 87. It, it, it's a, it's a displacement is a nasty thing, and I think that those who are prosecuting this current uh, agreement, wherever they are, you know, they, they must recognize that there's a desire for normalcy to return. Mm. Okay, mm. so let's just get uh, a current assessment. Just how did we get to this position? In December 2013, President Kerr uh, accused his former deputy, Rick Marshall, and 10 others of attempting, just as it's been described, the coup d'etat. And Marshall denied trying to start a coup and fled to lead the SPLM, SPLM which is uh, Sudanese People's Liberation Movement, in opposition, which is just a splinter group away from the original SPLM. Fighting broke out between the Sudan People's Liberation Movement and that particular splinter group, igniting the civil war. This is when the Ugandan troops were deployed to fight alongside the South Sudanese government. 
And the United Nations, of course, has peacekeepers in that particular entire region. So looking at the profile and the reputational character of all these actors, I, I, I want you to tell me whether you feel that there's a genuine search for peace and uh, a lasting uh, pacification of this whole conflict in your own view. Of course, considering all the stakeholders that we shall talk about in detail, but based on this narrative that I've given you, Dr. Tully. Yeah, <clears throat> my take on that um, is premised around the fact and opportunity that uh, since the IGAD uh, attempt, mm -hmm. there has been quite some time. So we have had an opportunity to actually review that, uh, that effort and uh, quite, sc quite seriously scrutinize. Yeah, when I talk about IGAD, uh, just for viewers, it's the Intergovernmental uh, yes. Association for Authority Development. For Authority for, for Development. Authority for Development, and it has eight countries, uh, which of course I'll come to list up uh, later on. Yes, you can continue. Yeah, so that agreement, uh, for those who have had opportunity to review it, they point out at about three crucial things that seriously impact on this attempt for peace in southern Sudan. Of course, um, we don't have much latitude in a discussion like this to try and trace, or as Professor Nevesa would say, historicize uh, the conflict in southern Sudan. Because the peace agreement, even of 2005, had flaws, you know, fundamental flaws around it. Mm -hmm. because and that is prior to the independence of the, the yeah just to the yeah, yeah the comprehensive agreement mm -hmm. and one of the key things at that time if i may just allude to it was that not not all the parties came to the table and i'll just demonstrate that by telling you that even even amidst this crisis mm -hmm. just a couple of months in recent years when uh, President Salva Kiir tried to take, make effort to stabilize uh, the peace agreement that was signed in Addis Ababa, you find that there is record that so far he has sort of reached some form of peace agreement or truce with 10,000, over 10,000 military, active military people. So, and in, 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 in security terms, 10,000 people are not, are not, it's not a small number. Mm -hmm. It's not a small number. And that, that is just this stabilization effort. So if you go back to that agreement, one of, one of the issues that people are faulting IGAD for was that IGAD sort of had uh, a fixated mind when they were approaching the events after 2013. Central to that agreement was an attempt to try and find these two characters to work together. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole idea, and, and you know, this, this, this started with the, with, this started, I think, from Kenya, the whole idea of power sharing. Mm -hmm. and, and the notion of power sharing, in a sense, has worked in brokering peace and stabilizing nations at war. But it has its own flaws that can be actively discussed. So in the case of the Sudan 2013 agreement, you find that whereas it centrally pushed to get these two gentlemen to work together, it seems the, the, the two characters um, are really, the, they, they are diametrically opposed to each other in terms of thinking and how they want to push Southern Sudan forward, mm. just to say yeah, the least. Uh, and of course, uh, we, they, there's a, the impression that uh, by Salva Kiir uh, playing these political shenanigans is a saboteur to actually having the pacification of this country and whatever his insistence on power holding, as uh, Professor Ndefesa was talking about, he seems to be one of the core problems. But as we shall talk later on about even other external groups, uh, uh, external interests, we shall see uh, perhaps bring in all these elements. And uh, If I may, yes. um, <coughs> one of the things I observed about this current process is that 
first of all, the war effort has wiped out much of the reserves of, uh, of the government of South Sudan. The government is broke. Uh, but also, all the fighting groups uh, for whom uh, some share, we call it power sharing, or, or the national yeah. cake was viable, have seen that that cake is either dwindling or it's no longer there. Uh, in the run-up to the meeting, the face-to-face -face meeting, people that I follow were telling me that uh, two things have pushed the Southern Sudanese. One was that the reality that they no longer had money, uh, and many of them were accustomed to a certain kind of uh, expectation, if I could put it uh, mildly. And the inflation is at two, over 200% mm -hmm. now. Yeah, but you can see that, apart the, from the economic problems, but you know, <laughs> to prosecute a war requires money, and if you've run out of coffers, it's done. The second thing is that there's been a deliberate push mm. to get these two people uh, drag them by the collar mm -hmm. uh, to the table. And this is not a, 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 a meeting that you saw where there were willing uh, uh, participants in the piece. And yeah, actually the first got them to add suburb bar there was, you know, Yeah, but the remember the that, 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 that Dr. Riyak Masha was in de facto yeah. house arrest mm -hmm. in this South, South Africa. Africa you know, one, yes. one has to wonder how he came uh, to that table. Uh, but also, um, and until almost the time that he went to to um, to, to Khartoum, uh, uh, President Kiir was saying, either privately or publicly, that he would never work with Riyak. Yeah, he actually wanted so anyway, protocol, so protocol so representation. So, so, so we can ask that yeah. who are these forces that have brought these two together mm. against their will, mm? perhaps for the good of the people, but against their will, and will those conditions hold? And if they are together only because they have been threatened uh, uh, by, you know, interests within or uh, outside of South Sudan, can they on their own maintain that path? Mm -hmm. Now, if, if, if your people around you are being threatened by sanctions, and I'll let David weigh in on this, and, but the principal parties are not willing to work together, you mm -hmm. know, how will such a peace hold? Yeah, so let, let me get the Professor and the as respond, then I get to Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. To me, I wouldn't want to reduce this conflict to these two characters, True. although the, 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 these two characters play a very great uh, and principal role, but let's not reduce it to these two characters, because there are other fighting groups and other commanders. Uh, I think I was reading somewhere, even the Shuruku, mm -hmm. the Shuruku, mm -hmm. how do yeah, they, Shiluk. Shiluk. they also have some commander who should be brought in, it should be inclusive. Mm -hmm. I am mm -hmm. told even mm -hmm. some people is in uh, Equatoria, in the central Equatoria, are also organizing. The, the, because they have been taken for a ride by these uh, Dinka, uh, who are Bahir Gazer and the Nuer, who are, uh, is it uh, Nairo? Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, upper Nairo. Uh, you see, I, 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 each section seems to be arming itself so that they can see how to bargain. Mm -hmm. And therefore, Although the two principles are very important, let's not concentrate on them. Secondly, SPRM, as a ruling party which is supposed to mediate all these conflicts, is a split, and it's not necessarily a split between Sarvakir and Rakamache. No. There are other issues. I mean, the, for example, this group led by the, 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 the wife of the late Garang mm. uh, is also on another side. To me, there are very many uh, overlapping issues. However, militarism, the philosophy of militarism mm. as a solution to the problems is the one which should be addressed. Mm. So and in, in, this in your own sense of judgment, do you feel that actually these parties that have been brought together, they actually have a willing interest in having peace? Or there's some actually who feel they want to, uh, just do some kind of scavenging in this whole chaos. And, uh, I'm not sure whether they are together. <coughs> I'm not sure whether they are together. Okay, let me get down. I'm not sure whether they are together. Uh, <laughs> let me get a, a response. Yeah, uh, uh, professor, yes. uh, professor, you, you might be quite right that there are some other uh, parties, but the signatories of the Khartoum Declaration has got involved 
with the, all the stakeholders of the, the Khartoum Peace Declaration. Agreement. Is this recent one? Yes, the, one the recent one, one. Yes. the one of yesterday. Yes, because you have got the South Sudanese uh, opposition political parties alliance. You see, those who have been involved uh, in the Addis Ababa uh, uh, negotiations, all their members were included. To, to come and join a hand so that it is an inclusive uh, peace agreement. Even yesterday, if you might have seen uh, Deng Alor, the tall and dark, uh, he was uh, my Minister of Foreign Affairs and he ran away by his own. He did not even resign officially. He just uh, took his bag <laughs> and went to, went to Addis Ababa. Up to now, we don't have Minister of Foreign Affairs. So, this group was represented by Deng Alor in that uh, signing uh, ceremony of yesterday. And then the other group was represented by uh, this fellow, uh, the one who was uh, standing uh, right of uh, President Kiir. So the inclusivity, it is there. So that's why we are uh, optimistic that the peace indeed uh, might come. Mm. Yeah. Because has what that, they were has talking. Has that Pharaoh from Addis Ababa also come? Yeah, they all came. They all came. Okay, you know, and David, you and know and that and this and is no, not the first I just time. Want to, I just want to you know that this is not the first time that this process has been undertaken. Yeah, and I want we to are asking you that I, do you I, feel, as a representative of the government, that actually Salva Kiyah himself is willing, is willfully uh, submitting himself to this process to bring a lasting peace to this nation? Or it's play, it's just games which are being played to suffocate the opposition? Uh, for Selva Kiir, is ever genuine mm -hmm. and he's committed because uh, he is with the majority of the population who always cries for him to bring peace mm -hmm. with the this uh, group. Okay, so he's willing. So what we are doing, mm -hmm. and I want to underline this, what we are doing here in searching for peace, it is not the peace as it is peace you say it. Mm -hmm. It is the agreement that will bring in those who have run away from home to mm -hmm. come and enjoy peace because peace is at home. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. in your house, you have yeah. peace when you already entered and locked it up. True. And on that note, yeah. let me just go for a break and then we come back. We talk about the ramifications in the geopolitical sense and Uganda in particular. How would the achievement of this peace help Uganda? Of course, in its difficulties that is facing because of the situation in South Sudan. Thanks, our viewers, for keeping with us. I'm Kaga Borins. Let's go for a break and we'll be back and to continue this discussion. And thank you all viewers for keeping with us. Once again, I'm Karagawa Bodwins, and we're discussing South Sudan peace agreement that was signed on Wednesday and supposed to take effect on Saturday, this very Saturday. And we're asking ourselves so many questions. Of course, this very country has so many implications on how it moves uh, forward on other countries, especially ours. So let me just give you this particular narrative about the geopolitical arrangement and especially the effect that happened after that incident of the war that broke up in South Sudan. Since 2006, South Sudan had been the destination for almost 20% of Uganda's exports, the largest share to any single country. That is how much of the economic contribution Uganda was actually having from that. So several thousand Ugandans uh, used to work in South Sudan's construction and services industries while supporting their families back home. And they had several uh, a, a great voluminous contribution to remittance accounts here in, U in Uganda of about 210 10 million US dollars uh, by 2012. When the war broke up, uh, Uganda is really suffering with uh, a fall down of the remittances. There's a continued instability and of course you know the influx of refugees in this country. So just Dr. Tolit, if this peace agreement or talks that are going on, if they come out to be positive, how do you think Uganda will actually be saved? And uh, do you feel that actually Uganda will get better uh, if South Sudan got this peace? And we, will we recover that kind of uh, maybe uh, economic leverage that we had by the time that uh, we broke off uh, from that, we settled off that war? Of course, true, going by, uh, going by the narrative you've just given, uh, if the situation in Southern Sudan ever normalizes, 
that, of course, who would be a huge welcome for us in Uganda. Um, because they has, besides the, 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 the official engagements, there was a real people process. If you go to the small border towns in Moyo, in, in, in Koboko, in Nimule, uh, I visited some of those places. I worked in some of those places when uh, that economy was buoyant. And um, it, it's completely depressing if, say, you walk to Nimule today and, and, and you, you sort of reflect on the picture of what Nimule was at the peak mm -hmm. of, 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 of that economic uh, excitement. Mm -hmm. So if this can work, and not only if it can, effort has to be put for this to work. Because already the Great Lakes region that we sit in quite central as Uganda is, has its own fragility. It's already fragile. So, as colleagues have already pointed out, the burden of refugees, uh, the diminished economy of southern Sudan, um, the political tensions, because you see what is interesting in this region is that what, even an incident, whether Shosho or otherwise in Juba, can potentially translate a, a, into a political issue in Kampala mm. eh? because there they, they is there is that uh, element of you know trans transnational mm. you know transnational conflict sensitivity but having said this with a lot of optimism I just would like to pour some water on this my concern and just like I told you that the agreement the the IGAD agreement of 2013 has given us opportunity to look through it and therefore would really quite actively urge that some of some of some of the mistakes some 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 of the some of the overthoughts in in that process need to be corrected and one of them that concerns me very much is that you see like I said peace is not an event peace needs to be built across bridges and through people because the centrality of peace building is people and in people the they, they are interests, they are positions. They, some of the people who participated in, in, in the IGAD uh, peace discussions, the framers, for instance, had an opportunity to listen to, 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 to this man who was expelled in 2015, the man who was the chairman of the Joint Monitoring Commission, Faji. Mm. He was presenting a paper at a... Uh, at, at Chatham House in London, and, and I listened to him. And he admits that one of the things for them as facilitators they failed to do is that they concentrated their discussions with the political elites in Juba. The pro good professor has just pointed out, Juba is quite, I mean, Southern Sudan is quite expansive. Mm -hmm. So you are discussing a peace process. Because if you look at that agreement, some of the fundamentals that have brought the challenges today are in about three areas. I think part three of that agreement talks about issues of accountability, which, I mean, looks at the events before the atrocities committed and, and is hinting at, you know, trials, court processes, um, purging, maybe sections of the police, sections of the army. And that is what is bringing problems. Because remember, Fundamentally, what we are seeing as the SPLA, SP, SPLM, SPLA, mm -hmm. uh, is really a conglomerate, you know, so to speak, of, uh, of really tribal militia groups mm -hmm. from the time, given, given the kind of wrath they were facing from the Khartoum government. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the double irony is that the Khartoum that they sort of sought solace from, or so a wave, away from, they to uh, from uh, now, now, now they are going back, back for solace. you know so this yeah. agreement being signed in Khartoum it's itself mm. um, uh, uh, any African would, would 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 look at it very very we, not suspiciously but mm. with suspicion okay because yeah? I, I need to say <laughs> we, we need to get a, an optimistic picture from this and uh, Dr. Nibesa uh, Professor Nibesa the 
argument that uh, you know Uganda is so vested in ensuring that we revive the capacity, the state capacity of uh, South Sudan and pacify that country, so that we get economic stability. Of course, we seem to be like actually we're economic captives of the dependence on South Sudan. That when South Sudan is not apparent, we are actually failing as an economy. I don't know what you have to say about the need. Uh, that is so desperately expressed by Uganda to actually recover uh, economically. Uh, let me first. And if there are other benefits that pass, we. But let at. me first state this: uh, yeah. for us to wish South and Sudan to stabilize because we want trade with it is necessary, but that is basically opportunistic. <laughs> We want South and Sudan, our But, but that's the reality of state uh, interests. Listen, uh, <laughs> state interests of. are also informed by interests as well as values. Like if for me I was a party player in these negotiations, mm -hmm. what I would put forward first primarily is values in the sense that we want these people in South and Sudan to have law and order, to access justice, to access uh, 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 services, mm -hmm. social services, primarily because they more or less they are living. Uh, in but the you understand that that is an argument for imperialism of being hegemonic. Because I need to have a sensible reason why I'm going to have an intervention in another country to my population to tell them that these are the benefits. It's so I think it's not sensible for wanting our brothers to stabilize. Is it only sensible when you are expecting a, an economic return? I don't want to have that uh, paradigm. That we need our brothers, we are Pan-Africanists, we need our brothers, our neighbors to have peace. And because they will have peace, we could also have peace and feel good. But I'm not discounting the economic one. But the economic one can bring in problems because it, it is going to be opportunistic. Opportunistic in the sense that Uganda will have vested interest in terms of economy. Kenya will have vested interest. Ethiopia will have vested interest. Sudan has got other interests. Now... If we use those ones primarily and put them forward, we miss the, the, the principal issue. The principal issue is justice and peace in southern Sudan. So, mm. yes, in we your, shall lose. In your own argument, Uganda has, should have an ulterior or an extrinsic motive to have intervention or to pursue this peace, uh, this peace project. Not necessarily that there is a strategic interest that is going to benefit Uganda. H how does that... Even strategic interest can come in. I am saying primarily, mm. make a distinction between primarily and secondary. I'm not saying economic interest uh, is not important, but it is secondary. Primarily it is that intrinsic value that we should wish Southern Sudan to achieve peace in its own right, not necessarily because we are vultures. We are just waiting to take advantage of, uh, of whatever economic situation. Because when we do that, mm. then we are likely to go there and root, rooting in quotes, mm. to just go there and promote corruption there, to make sure that we get the fastest thing that we can get. In Southern Sudan, Southern Sudanese, they will wake up and say, by the way, you people, it seems your purpose of coming here is to exploit us. Mm. Like the Rwanda is actually at one time they stopped us even from exporting there when we went there with that opportunistic mind. So let's not go, because there are many other costs, by the way, even to Uganda, which are not necessarily issues of, of economy. Disease, health mm. issues, because that country is not stable. They are not doing immunization. They are not uh, having health services. We could have very many primitive diseases uh, recognize us through Sudan and Congo, our neighbors. Mm. We are talking about, I think somebody talked about environmental issues. Mm. Those, the, the environmental costs to, to, to us here. So you, there, you is a the there is issue. a security question. Mm. There is gun running mm. as we talk because mm. of this insecurity around. Some of the tribes in Uganda, as he pointed out, uh, uh, Angel Izama, could even lose their identity. You can imagine people coming from southern Sudan and they are, they are to number the, the locals they have found, the hosts they have found here. Before you know it, they are intermarrying their whatever. You can have Ugandans become refugees mm. and the refugees become nationals. Of course, you can become internally displaced. So, think that is can, an so we have to be very careful yeah, about so opportunistic that let Sudan stabilize yes. because we want to to benefit economy. Yeah, health. absolutely. That should be okay. So securitizing, of course, in social terms, in economic terms, and of course, health terms. I, I, I need, okay, Angelo, first give a take on this, then I, I end up with uh, David on that particular aspect of 
how what what should be the driving force behind of course all these east african countries especially uganda in particular which has even deployed uh, soldiers in that country in getting back this country together i mean the the um the common denominator of any good foreign policy is shared prosperity and <coughs> the professor is right in the sense that shared prosperity is not only defined in the economic terms mm. but the, the animosity towards ugandans had already begun in juba i think there have been clashes between mm. you know migrant ugandan workers there and locals um, it's xenophobic attacks on ugandans that caused the intervention of our mission there several times when um, southern sudanese beat kidnapped or killed Ugandans and the primary issue there was, you know, these guys have come to take our jobs and loot our country. Mm -hmm. you no, know, shared prosperity has to be a wider concept. But I think this, um, while the current crop of East African leaders are on the right path, a lot of these guys are former revolutionaries who are too comfortable with state power now. You know, that's that's my reading of uh, of, of what's going on because. <coughs> Almost all East African leaders are refugees, apart from, I think, the Tanzanians and the Kenyans, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yes. Joseph Kabila was a refugee here. He used to live somewhere in Kavalagala. I have been to the late John Garang's house in Muyenga, where he used to stay. I'm a fan of Garang, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Paul Kagame, I think he has a, he had a house <laughs> here in <laughs> Kololo. Mm -hmm. Then seven, President uh, seven. Salva Kiir, you know, was you know, he had he used to run his operations uh, in the in the western axis out of our town <laughs> there in of Moyo, is a refugee. Yuram Seven himself, you know, he became radicalized as a refugee in in uh, in Kenya and in Tanzania. Um, but also, a, a, a fundamental thing underlying their ex political experience and growth is that they're dealing with fake borders. Because who's a refugee really? Mm. These borders are imposed on us. Borders are imposed by an imperial project. There are more Luos, for example, in, in South Sudan than in, in, in Uganda. He's more or less our cousin, you know? Should we allow state building on the European model to hold us hostage about what we are saying, especially what you, what you yourself described as, you know, <laughs> some kind of um, uh, normative e economic interest? All mm. of those are games <coughs> that came out of Europe, by the way. No, but uh, statehood building is a historical fact, and if you don't, if you have a nation that has no, no proper state structure, no. the, especially the lack of centralization, the reason you see that certain countries are broken and are not managed I, is because I, they don't have a central I, I, control. I, I disagree and with uh, you, but uh, I think that that is primarily just the the narrative that came out of Britain and and the European states who had been fighting for many many years and mm. exported that state model via imperialism. I'm not saying that Africans should 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 do. By the way, the vision that um, that explained uh, John Garang in his analysis of what the fundamental problems in, in South Sudan uh, was that the South had been at war with itself for very long. Mm. The role of uh, our neighbors or their neighbors uh, as guys is to ensure that we share not just our peace but our prosperity. Not mm. because they are another state but mm. because we have, we have a shared brotherhood. Okay, for well, the last comment on this. Uh, so, David, mm. uh, you <coughs> see there's an accusation that uh, most of the refugees that we have here, except of course those I think in the north, but the ones I've seen uh, moving around in Kampala, they're having such an opulent, you know, illustrious lifestyle. They drive Porsche cars. You mean the and southern and Sudanese elite? Uh, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm so so th there is a, a dilemma here. Some of them are not refugees. The they are just uh, Aryans who are here <laughs> opportunistic. Exactly. So, David, it, it seems that to, actually to, for to, you, you're flourishing amidst this and particular and conflict and, and chaos. And, invest. Uh, and you would have no problem, perhaps, to have uh, South Sudan resettled and, you know, repacified. It's it's uh, you you feel there is no burden on you to actually so because most of the people who are here they're using U.S. dollars as refugees. Uh, do you feel that actually there is an imperative upon South Sudan to make sure that we have a better country in South Sudan so that we can have a shared prosperity as this gentleman is saying, or uh, you feel we can still move on with this and gain along the because you have oil, you have other issues and. You have customers because I've seen one of your foreign ministers actually going up in Europe and in US looking for market for the oil that you own. 
Yeah, you, you see, when it comes into uh, where to live in East Africa here, you, you understand there is an East African integration uh, a process that has been on. But let us go back down to the history. If you look into the 42 tribes of Uganda here, maybe you will get out of them only 10 that did not pass through South Sudan. Only 10 out of 42. The rest, even in the civic education of Uganda, professor is here. They are taught that uh, the migration from Bar al Ghazal, the people of the Nilo, they pass along here up to Nyarkaj, yeah, they were at the home of uh, those of uh, Udinga. So there is that interlinkages of the people of the East African with the South Sudan in particular. I did not mean that we, are, we come this side. Even you, you can also come the other side, as you said before. And we, we will speak the same languages, you know, and the language remains the same. So for uh, the economic gain, it's not the, the main uh, uh, purpose for uh, Uganda to come to South Sudan only to get money. Mm. No, some of them. Yeah, but just come. answer for me in yeah. one minute. Why? Why is it that most of the people, the South Sudanese who are in Kampala, mm. they are living such uh, an opulent, literally obscene, you know, illustrious life, and your people are there languishing. They are in the best international schools. You have the best cars. I think the South Sudanese have the most not flashy cars in Kampala. Yeah, yeah, you Don't you? Isn't that too much of a, an obscene way of expression of your need to actually pacify your country uh, when you're uh, living in such uh, a very uh, no, no, uh, profligate uh, manner? Uh, no. Of course, it is not everybody that goes and buy uh, 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 some tomatoes in a window. There are some other, there is a bodies where you can buy something. If you buy in a window, it might be uh, 500 bob, but if you go to, to Nakasero, mm. it will be now 2,000. So, no, that's it is not even what who is equal uh, in any way. If they okay, drive so Porsche, if they drive Porsche, mm -hmm. if they drive a Porsche car, mm -hmm. for example, maybe the parents, they have got their money. Exactly. And it the is not everybody uh, that has got a class. There is no everybody who has got a class. There are even more poorer people in America. Okay, and thank uh, you, David. And not point, I'll go for a break, and I'll come back and wrap up on that. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you nice. guys. Uh, let me just go for a break, and then we'll come back and uh, just uh, have a way to wrap up this discussion. Thank you, our viewers, for keeping with us on this late night on the sport program, and we're discussing the pacification process of South Sudan. And the, the peace talks has different parties and negotiation brokers. You have, of course, the SPLM, uh, which is the original uh, party for revolution of making sure that uh, South Sudan became an independent state. Then you have the SPLM in opposition group, which is led by the former vice president, Rick Marshall. You have IGAD. IGAD is a composition of eight uh, countries, and if you've been with us in the beginning of the uh, talk show, uh, you would have known, you, you have heard us talk about that. And it's, it includes Egypt, rather Djibouti, Apologies on that. Ethiopia, Eritrea, Kenya, Somalia, the Sudan, South Sudan, and Uganda. Then there's the African Union. You oh, have yeah. the United Nations. You have China involved. You have the EU involved. You have USA, UK, and Norway, which is a compact called Troika because of the oil interest that they had. But, of course, China has more leverage uh, on South Sudan. And then you have the Federal Democratic Party led by uh, Gathoth, Gatruth and uh, the National Democratic Movement as uh, some of the splinter groups in this particular conflict. So, gentlemen, uh, as we're talking about, of course, the profligacy that uh, is expressed by the people who are in exile, uh, including Uganda refugees, Let, let's also talk about the management. Do you feel that this peace brokerage management is being done appropriately, or it's not coherent, and perhaps actually there's no good faith in doing this? Yes, Dr. Tori. Yeah, um, my... my I would like to think this way, that uh, there, is, there, there, there is quite some effort that has been put because uh, IGAD as a, a sub-regional organization has been focused in the area of, uh, <coughs> you know, peace building particularly. Uh, the development aspect of IGAD uh, cannot be spoken about very much. So they have quite an experience. <coughs> When you look through it, if you see some of the individuals that are engaged in these processes, 
they are, you know, quite astute people, seriously qualified, seriously experienced. And I would want to believe that, but are uh, they politically credible? I, I would. Are they politically I, credible? I, I because if you look at Djibouti, if you look at Ethiopia, if you look at Eritrea, which was coming from a war experience with Eritrea before, you know, they separated. They, they are serious uh, background uh, problems and taints. In yeah, I, I, I want to come to that. You see, yeah, you, just you, you cannot yes. discount mm. the I mean, the philosophical foundations mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> around which this whole peace framework has been conceptualized. You can't discount them on that. Um, but true to what you're saying, uh, if, if we are to have any lasting peace for southern Sudan, we need to become much more In agile. South Sudan. South I mean, Sudan. South Sudan. Not Southern Sudan. Oh, South Sudan. We need to yeah. become much more agile on on how we look at the players and what we demand of them. Mm. I raised one issue in the beginning, and that was how much involvement of the ordinary people is being done in this process. Because we are having a situation where there is a discussion with the political, the business, and, uh, and probably the, 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 the social elite, largely based around Juba, and they are far remote places, like the lake states. Uh, if you come down towards the uh, Torit, bordering, uh, bordering Kenya, there are, sub, there, there are subnational issues there. And yet all these pieces we are talking about can only be augmented through this person-to-person -person, you know, conveyance. Mm -hmm. So that is a real obstacle. And then two, again around the managers and the influencers, my concern is just individual states, how serious are they? Because, for, for instance, uh, Sudan, by the way, is, is, is not a tech for freehold. There is, there is something in Sudan. There is oil in Sudan. There is oil money in Sudan. Yes. And for instance, the one Troika. One of the intriguing uh, uh, statements or perhaps uh, provisions in this argument is that they want Sudan, the Sudan government, to superintend in the protection of that particular oil uh, worth in, in, in mm. Sudan, which is pretty uh, really ironical that <laughs> you're talking exactly. about a person. Yes, yes just, just... Yeah, because, yeah, and, and I agree with you, yeah. because the, the, that conversation has fundamentally shifted. 205, the narrative was South Sudan oil for South Sudanese. Sudanese. And the person who was being actively being locked out was Khartoum. Mm -hmm. Now, in this deal, Khartoum has centrally bounced back and is being accepted as a steward. Mm -hmm. So the question then would be, <laughs> when you look over your shoulder, yeah. is this a steward that you're comfortable with? And then just the last thing, like the good professor has been pointing out, the issues of peace and justice. Because the, the, only, the, the actual guarantor of peace or stability is justice. Mm. So the the way the, the weather to, to you know to crack the, the whip AU IGAD or the neighboring states. But the, the 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 UN the UN the UN representative or superintendent on, uh, on 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 genocide mooted that there was near genocide in southern Sudan. Yeah. You know there has been serious uh, at atrocities in South Sudan. Yeah, actually, it's uh, been reported. The issues of accountability. How are we going to deal with okay. it? Yeah, you so know? Actually, just a second. I, I need, uh, let me get a comment from An uh, Angelo and then get phone calls because I'm hearing a long buzz of, of, of calls and just uh, the management of this entire process and the multiplicity of uh, stakeholders involved. What is your take on that? Uh, then I get phone calls. And like I said, I can only look at this from a <coughs> Ugandan uh, position looking across the border like <coughs> so you gotta got involved with the SPLA during its revolutionary phase largely because our enemies were the same our enemies were the Islamist racist government in Khartoum the same guys who uh, you know uh, were embracing <laughs> the, <laughs> the, 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 the 
they were fighting proxy wars, but most importantly, fundamentally, I think at uh, at an ideological level, the Ugandan and the Southern Brotherhood rejected the view of the of from Khartoum, imposing uh, through in, in basically an imperial mindset a vision of Sudan that was Arabic, that was Islamist, mm -hmm. that was racist. <coughs> This is basically what's at stake here. But and John Garang, actually, he said in, his, in, that, in that speech I quoted earlier that that was the problem of Sudan, mm -hmm. that there was an, a, 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 a machinery of marginalization based upon a hegemonic Islamist eh? uh, an, Arabic. A, an Arabic vision, mm -hmm. and that's what caused it. Okay. Now, no. the second thing he said was that the, the job, the, 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 the SPLA, SPLM, okay, uh, winning back the peace was winning the right to self-determination. Now, if you don't see those things <coughs> being aligned in the current process, it just will tell you that it won't go very far away. Right. I think yeah, what but I, I want to uh, add, uh, uh, I want to add on. The role of Khartoum, why did Khartoum bounce back in this agreement and the management of the peace deal itself? You know, Khartoum, has got an agreement with us, even after the cessation of South Sudan or uh, the, the, the gaining of independence. Mm -hmm. We still have some issues that were left over the CPA. Yeah, the conference One of them the is the transportation yes. of the oil mm -hmm. and uh, the pipeline itself, mm -hmm. where China <coughs> get involved, and you have uh, the Khartoum uh, getting in. Some stakeholders or other friends might have taken us to be uh, somehow mint, but we found the Chinese with the Khartoum. What we have just inherited, it was only our soil that has got the oil in it, you see. But so, they have no infrastructure uh, to be able to uh, process it. Exactly. Okay. So, uh, the role of Khartoum here yes. will manage the peace agreement because they have got their incentive within the agreement of the pipeline that we are renting. Mm, okay. So I, I the transportation a, also comes with the protection. Yeah, it's an understandable explanation. Yeah, because so the, 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 the longest the part of the the longest part of the pipeline yes. ran through uh, Sudan. All right, you have mm. a viewership that is interested in this discussion. Now, viewers, I can hear you calling. Uh, please, uh, who is online? Uh, I can get to hear your view, your question or comment. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Hello. Please, good evening. I'll uh, try to be more audible. Make sure you mute your TV set and give us your comment or question yeah, as briefly as you can. Hello? This is, this is Felix. Okay. Uh, I'm calling from Kampala. All right. I can hear you. What's your question or comment? Now, my issue here, mm -hmm. first of all, I want to say thank you for the program. You're welcome. And, and the panels that you have there. And thank you for watching the interview. Now, there are issues that uh, I believe that the, the delegation that went to Karatum did not consider in regards to the peace agreement that was signed yesterday. We are now dealing with three functions. But I am meant to understand that there is a faction that belongs to General Paul Malone, the former chief of defense for this. Mm -hmm. uh, you also have here the one, uh, the, 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 the dose of uh, Taban Den guy. Remember Taban Den, when Dr. Riek Machar went to exile, mm -hmm. he came back, became a very good loyal candidate to the government. He declared himself as a part of SPLM, not IO. Mm. He managed to integrate some of the forces that were in I.O. to the National Army. Mm. And there are those ones who still play allegiance to him. Mm. Oh, okay, gentlemen, I will just now. be a bit disruptive to your submission. Because the, the, the conflict in South Sudan is incredibly intricate. And we don't want to get the comment that is extremely intricate. I need you to make a comment as, ex a, as a brief as possible and, or a comment. And then or rather a question then move forward. Okay, I think what line. he's saying is that yeah. the peace deal has not been inclusive. Even mm. in yeah, list. okay, so yeah. it's not <laughs> comprehensively inclusive. Yes, the, uh, the, 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 let me first get to Professor Ndavisa. Mm. So his concern. 
and uh, of course the management you had not uh, made a comment about it they do, are you comfortable with the multiplicity of these stakeholders are you think hello okay hello just as <laughs> uh, good evening hello. gentlemen uh, where are you calling from what's your question or comment uh, hello. please mute your tv tv set otherwise we will not be able to have uh, i'm calling mubarak no 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 please you mute it? your tv set i'm getting feedback uh, in the studio hello okay now i can hear you. yes Yes, I'm called Mubarak from Boyogeredi. Okay. Uh, the South Sudan's leaders, or <coughs> those groups all should come down. My comment is, uh, there is a problem in South Sudan that uh, all, uh, there are many functions. The detainees, the, the group of uh, Riyak Machal, the group of the former uh, chief of staff, Mm. And all those people, they all need to be president. That is the problem. They want so to be president. They, sh <laughs> they, they should first sit down. Mm. They leave the, 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 the chair for the president. So let them first work for the citizens. Mm. Let them work for the citizens. When you go to Juba, all the parts of South Sudan have ever been there. People are starving. People mm. are suffering. Yet, just few people are the ones enjoying but the locals are starving. They don't have food. For them, they just look at it. They just uh, uh, see themselves that they are support. They, 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 they just need power. Okay, don't thank you, Mubarak. Your point is good. I think there needs to be a concentration of the political players and make sure they concentrate on the, uh, the, the, the travesty, the, the, the adversities of their people and make sure that they bring back the state. Yes, your comment. Thank you. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, of course, uh, the fundamental actors that should bring peace to Sudan are the South Sudanese themselves, basically. Mm. But they also need to get uh, complemented by international or regional actors. Mm. Uh, the challenge with IGAD is that, uh, you know, the South Sudan question, mm. problem, is also a political question besides being a military question. Mm. Now, there is this saying that you cannot give what you don't have. Now, the IGAD members <laughs> do not follow the rule of law. Exactly. They not have so no spirit of constitutionalism. Mm -hmm. They are militarists. How they are going to give that peace element to South Sudan when they themselves are not do not, peace with their do not follow... The, uh, the rule of, of law yes. and constitutionalism, which brings about sustainable peace, mm -hmm. is a very big, big, big question. Mm -hmm. However, I think the international community needs to bring incentives to South, South Sudan people to come to the table. Mm -hmm. ECOWAS has done better, mm -hmm. relatively better, yes. than that EAC is the economic and community. Igad. Of West Africa. Of West States. Africa. In fact, yeah. ECOWAS of West Africa, Economic Committee of yeah. West Africa. Now, uh, Professor, just a second, because I, I need. Hello? I can hear a caller online. Apologies, I, I need to make sure that I have it. Hello? Hello? Good evening, and uh, please help me mute your TV set. Very good. Uh, your name and where you're calling from, then your comment or question. All right. Uh, the caller is off. Uh, the Hello? 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 Yes, gentlemen, good evening. Your name and where you're calling from? Your question? Um, I'm Uncle Dan. Yes, Dan. Yes, um, my comment is just a simple one that I feel that the situation in South Sudan. I can hear you, yes. Yes, I feel that the situation in South Sudan mm -hmm. is a situation of. Uh, carrying out identity beyond the necessary. Mm. Yeah, you find one tribe divided among itself, yeah. or one tribe is favoring itself against the others. So I think that's an issue that needs to be sorted first. Okay, great. Uh, David, what's your comment about that? You're so factionalized. Your country is so tribalistic. You are centered on individual interests. Uh, do, do you think that that's what needs to be first sorted, actually, before you get even into international cooperation? But uh, yeah, we respond to that. Let me get this other caller. Let me get two more callers, and then we have a response. Hello? Hello? Yes, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, you, where are you calling from? Of course, your name, question and comment. Hello? I can hear you. Good evening. 
Good evening. Hello. Okay, can I have another caller? Because it seems uh, we are not receiving each other uh, with this caller. Hello? Okay, so the, the calls at the moment are halted. So, yes, David, and then I, I, I go to him. Yeah, you, you see, I do believe that uh, this uh, notion of the identity, it was not there when we were fighting the war. Mm. Because when we were fighting the war, it was between us, the black people in South Sudan, mm -hmm. and the northerners who had their own uh, racial identification. So when uh, these issues come up now, like what uh, it was termed by some few individuals who do not have a knowledge. Myself, my mom is a Nuer, and my father is a Dinka. So should uh, anything erupt or any fight, I don't think whether I will take that uh, seriously, besides my job being a diplomat. So uh, there is uh, nothing of uh, that kind. Because if you see the government, the government has got uh, ways of balancing the power. Mm -hmm. For instance, when we were uh, during uh, the, the struggle, you would get thousands of the Dinka soldiers, without even nowhere among them, when you go to the other part, you will get even thousands of the people of Equatorian without even Dinkas among them. But they were fighting the common enemy. Mm -hmm. So when you <coughs> see the majority uh, of the information that has been portrayed mm -hmm. outside that there is a so-called Dinka, the Dinka might be, uh, you know, famous, mm -hmm. you see, or the majority are said. But then what, I don't think even the Spanish people see, not agree with you because there's actual allegation that there's a dinkanization of that particular state. It has and at the same time, they, of course, as you're describing, the effort to make sure that you get back a statehood structure mm. and de, de distance yourself or deconstruct yourself from the clashes of the Sudanese. That was a common purpose at that time. I just and the objective you, I, was that you can become you. all common benefactors let me just give in you. the attainment of, of a state. Let but give now you, let it has been dominated let me give by the homework. Dinkas. Yes. Let me give you a homework. If you find a time tomorrow, you go and Google the cabinet, okay? Mm -hmm. Or the government of South Sudan. You go and Google it, and uh, you bring the list, we will mark it. The okay. Dinkas are very few in that government. And the majority of them are the Nuer and the people of, of uh, Equatoria mm -hmm. and the rest of the, the tribes. Mm -hmm. There are no Dinkas, my Dinkas there. Okay. And uh, you could see. But I wanted to make a, a quick rejoinder there. Yes. Politics is algebraic, it's not mathematical, mm. it's <laughs> not arithmetic. Mm. You could have 10 Dinkas <laughs> who have who <laughs> wearing more power than 109 Dinkas. You could even have one Dinka having more authority and influence more than 200 non-Dinka. Non mm -hmm. So it is, uh, we now want algebra. Yeah. Where they we balance the equation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I, I think we, are, we, we have made effort, especially when looking at the right, dynamics. Well, the last thing I want us to right. talk about, because I think we've made deliberate effort to seeing the intricacies and the, of course, the polarization of the state and the complexities of uh, how this particular pacification is being managed. Let's talk about the East African arrangement. Because uh, South Sudan, of course, applied for membership in 2011. It was rejected by then. Uh, by the East African Council, but in 2016 it was, it was uh, uh, embraced as to be one of the members. One of the things I'm asking myself that is baffling, how was South Sudan principally really integrated into the East African community? Do you think this was an appropriate decision that actually we, we rushed to have the South, Sudanese, the South Sudan state be integrated in the East African community? Do you think it's a worthy member into the community or not? Let me start with you, Zama, then come to Dr. Ray. I don't think that the South Sudanese needed an application to join the <coughs> East African community. Like I told you, these states have been imposed on us, okay? I don't know why you are, you are giving so much uh, credibility to an arrangement. The, first of all, the, 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 the kind of um, <coughs> uh, transnational state that is imagined under East African community is just to accommodate the area in its default position. It's a natural position, mm -hmm. okay? Yes, we want the uh, uh, the Eastern Congolese to join, <coughs> okay? Mm. 
Because that's the way the, geog but, but, but the geography see, of the area. Your, your description mm. is so simplistic. Because you know that there's politics in trying to conglomerate nationalities. Of course, if it's, you it, have it is, it is, South Sudanese who have had their own inherent national interests, you bring Ugandans. But I'm it's the same actually as you see a country like Uganda, that you bring different tribes, and if one tribe becomes supersedingly domineering, it becomes a problem. So no. you cannot simply say... We actually not. I, I actually reject okay, that so view. I I I, 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 I agree that I agree that the British, in imposing control over this area, decided to politicize tribes. And for the professor here, I can uh, can can back me up. Mm -hmm. They suddenly, with divide and rule, decided to politicize mm -hmm. tribes. That policy was exported to the bigger geography, where now the polities became larger states. But the diversity. Well, let me give you an example. African. Uh, and any child, for example, at the border right now, even in the refugee camps where they, uh, uh, our brothers and sisters are, how many languages do they speak? Mm. Mm -hmm. How many languages a, do you a speak? A multiplicity of them, definitely, yeah. depending on where you're staying. Okay, so you are saying... How you, many you, languages, if you went to so it, I, uh, how many uh, exactly. languages do you... So you feel uh, uh, South Sudan was appropriate to uh, be my, integrated? My, my yeah. argument yeah. is that there shouldn't have been some kind of application process that says South Sudan... No, it is a should, yeah. That, that, Sudan, yeah, yeah. that Sudan, yeah. Sudan should have, ar should have be arrived with this criteria to integrate. I think that they should have been admitted without reservation. And without reservation... Even uh, right now, we should have assisted them in their problems. That's my position. Okay, good. Yes, yeah. I have, I have then I'll come to you. Doctor. I have a different uh, yes. position here. Uh, should South Sudan, South Sudan, not South Sudan, <laughs> South Sudan become part of East African community? Should it have? Actually, it's already in. It the, in the yeah, it should <laughs> it have. It should, ideally. But I think East African community integration process has been too economistic. And they are far opportunistic. You see, you could use the integration process actually to create incentives for democracy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the rule of law. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there should have been conditions exactly. for South Sudan to come in in terms of observing rule of law, democracy, human rights observance, and, that, and, and what have you. But now that it is already part of the South African community, can't the East African community peer group, peer group use that incentive to create peace and stability in Southern Sudan? The challenge is what I pointed out before. Who is going to prevail upon Sudan to behave mm -hmm. politically when they are also not behaving in their home areas? To, to behave in a democratic in constitutional, a democratic constitutional manner. manner. Just, just a quick rejoinder to, to the European professor. European Union mm. does it mm. before you join and even after you have joined. They insist that you should follow certain rules set down and you should have certain commonality of good governance within, within EU or else you will be denied certain privileges. Exactly. But in the East African community, who is going to do that? Because if you tell me you're bringing yeah, broken they, states, which I'm not going to do that. So the, the, if, the, I, if, I, if, if, I, if you could yield your time, I wanted to challenge yeah. the professor's approach because initially he said that the problem in East Africa is that none of these so-called peers want to practice constitutionalism. And my argument would be, well, if all of them don't want to practice constitutionalism, maybe it's the constitutions that have a problem with us, not the other way around. At the same time, your argument is that let's put conditions for South Sudan so that we can manage its, 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 uh, its democratic evolution. But at the same time, that's a condition for admitting South Sudan into a, into a group that doesn't practice. Let's talk about the, the conditions for expelling. When should the East African community expel a member? Going by your argument... They should put up those. Yeah, going by your argument, none of these organizations, none of these peers would be in the East African community in the first place. Yep. Because okay. none of so them is, 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 <laughs> is practicing is any right. of the things so they say that to bring them together. Uh, uh, my, uh, right? What I'm hearing from Izama, for him he feels that, uh, you know, a, any country, of course it's not an argument about because the East African because community because intervention. Because the professor is not, is not, is not looking at his... Do you feel that there are certain conditionalities that should have been fulfilled? As just a standard procedure for integration, either economically, to bring so into a fold. At least exactly. Which other and at have. the time that South Sudan was integrated into the East African community, it doesn't seem that it was right. It wasn't, uh, you know, politically stable. It wasn't economically functioning. It didn't have a central state that was holding. Do you feel that was an appropriate decision taken? I, 
I would like to approach that question this way. I mean, following very actively between the the, <coughs> the argument between the professor and and, and the Zama, you know, would, um, we need probably need to become a little more realist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we would mm -hmm. would if we took that path, the professor would want us to define the epistemology in in, in, in this and the onology. But I think the, uh, the, the activism we are talking about here, and I think me, I would want to commend even the minimum leadership we are seeing from these leaders that they have taken. The, because the situation in Sudan is, is, is urgent. It's there. We are talking about people, displaced people, starving, mm -hmm. people having crimes being meted against them. Women are being raped right in, in containment centers in the center of, of Juba. So how does a regional body actively engage? For instance, at the moment, Salva Kiir's government has taken, uh, militarily it has gained some, quite some superiority. Largely most parts of Southern Sudan, I mean South Sudan, are now under the forces of Salva Kiir. Because of the treatment provided no, by Museveni, rather the, 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 our uh, government, actually with soldiers and with enablement with uh, well, ammunition. That, well, so <laughs> I want to agree, but that aside, yeah. in terms of the responsibility of this regionalism, the regionalism concept we are pushing, mm. for instance, me, I would like to urge that this government has a responsibility, as a government, as a sitting government at the moment. Which one? The one of Salva Kiir. Mm. And I would want to see that the, the, the peers in this regional body should urge it strongly to push for further peace, push for growth. You know, like Akola told you, there are sections of southern Sudan are unreachable mm. with, basic, f with basic necessities. Mm. A humanitarian <coughs> corridor needs to be opened. Because some of the, 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 the tenants or the mm. fundamentals we're talking about that should allow you in or keep you out are, are, are arguably some of these realities of life. Mm -hmm. You know, can you eat? Can you sleep? Can you go to hospital? Can you go to school? So if we are talking about a democratic community, mm -hmm. then that discussion is not a discussion we can conclusively come to at this table. Mm -hmm. Because it calls many things. The mm -hmm. other thing, for instance, you talked One, about the Troika. Just that seconds, please. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I know we, we are running out of time. Apologies on uh, stopping over. Mm -hmm. And let's now, listen to David. Yeah, David. So, your own particular view on this aspect, is because you have over 300,000 people estimated to have been killed. The instances of, you know, people who are starving, as it's been mentioned right there, according to the IMF, the real income has halved since 2013, and inflation is literally in the roof of 300% per annum. So, how, what, what is your future view of South Sudan and the East African community that you belong to, just uh, as we wrap up? Yeah, you see, the... South Sudan was uh, not uh, uh, <coughs> created in 2011 when they gained independence. Mm -hmm. Because when you talk of East Africa, you are talking of people. Yes. And these people, they were ever been there, mm -hmm. you see. Whether you admit them with a certificate or you don't <laughs> admit them or give them a degree, they will be the members of the East African. As we, 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 we mentioned it before, the interlinkages and the, and the, and the relation mm. between the people. So with that concept of saying, oh, South Sudan should apply to come to East Africa, it is the members of the East African themselves who said South Sudan is our member. And there, there, there could be no any other way for us to say, no, 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 you, you guys stop here. Because it would be like, okay, you can be a member of even the Arab League. When you are in Djibouti or when you are in uh, Cameroon. So the interlinkages, the bilateral, the, the closeness of the people from the origin of the, the, the East Africa, that brought them to in together. When it comes to the governance of the regional bloc, you have got also, we have joined so many members of uh, so many groups, you see. And uh, if, if need be, uh, the, the East African, are the one who said South Sudan is our member. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, so and just, just in, anyway, in 10 seconds, what, what is your future view? Do the you future think view of the East African, of course, the, we will be members of the East African mm-hmm. as long as we live in East Africa. All right, uh, Dr. Tuli, just uh, three words about the prospect of this peace agreement. Just all of us as a conclusive remark. Um, f- my, 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 my parting shots are really that um, in, in whatever efforts that are being taken, the people should be put at the center of this. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes uh, uh, Professor. Yes, uh, there should be uh, incentives put on the political class in Ijuba mm. to accept uh, this peace talks. I, I will give just one example in conclusion. Uh, the political class I, I, in Ijuba, the administration in Ijuba, uh, the, and some people in the rebel er, uh, group, the SPRM, or is it OI? Yes. I.O. In, I-O. O, in opposition. Yes. yes. The uh, families are living here in Kampala and Nairobi very comfortably when people are suffering in, in the space camps. They have their bank accounts around. They have businesses around. They have bought properties around. Here, Nairobi, and other quarters, even in Europe. Can there be a method of identifying those properties, do identifying those accounts, identifying those people, and we put embargo on them temporarily in order to create an incentive for them to come to the negotiating table and furthermore accept to keep peace? Because it seems there is no incentive for them. Their families are enjoying here. They themselves are enjoying. Their wives are here. Their business are booming. When their fellow citizens are in displaced camps and living in a state of nature, which uh, Thomas Hobbes talks about, where life is brutal, nasty, and everything. Thank you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Angela, <laughs> you just 10 seconds, so please. Yes. That, uh, <coughs> it, uh, the <coughs> former revolutionary, now President uh, Yoram Severi, apparently uh, was invited to a housewarming <coughs> one of his colleagues in, in Muyanga, a very beautiful house, and he asked the general why he didn't build the house in Juba. <laughs> but of course, there is a, mm. it's, a, it's a complicated uh, uh, situation because the money that the Southern Sudanese spend here is spent on, again, a, a, a looting class. You know, these East African uh, elites enabled the looting in South, in South Sudan. They're the beneficiaries. Mm-hmm. The houses that they are bought here, the cars, all of that money is transferred into the hands of people who have an interest in what's happening in South Sudan. Mm-hmm. But like I said, I look at what's happening in South Sudan from across the border. I think that if the ceasefire holds, even if it's for three weeks, God hope it is six months, the net benefit of that is that people will feel covered. And even in the refugee camps, I mean, it's, it, those guys walked across the border. I expect that if the peace holds, we shall see an, an exodus that is natural back. back to the country. And that's really what everyone wants. Okay, so thank you so much. Gentlemen, Angelo Izama is, uh, my, of course, the uh, prominent journalist who has been here for quite a while. And uh, David Amo, South Sudan em- embassy official, Mwembusia, um, the best political historian at Makere University, and Dr. Tulit Atia, security expert. Thank you, gentlemen, for making this a resplendent discussion. Thank you. And our viewers, indeed, thanks for keeping with us till this late night hour. Keep watching NTV and on the sport will continue. I believe Kamara will be back next week. I'm Karaga Baldwin. Have a great night and keep us as your number one station.